William the Conqueror is perhaps one of the most important kings of England, if not the most important. Without the Norman invasion of England that he spearheaded in 1066, it's fair to say that the history of England and the entire world would probably look very different. Not only would the English language as we know it probably not exist, instead, people in England would most likely speak a modern version of Anglo-Saxon English, it's possible England itself would not have emerged as the dominant force it did in later history, and so English itself might not have become the most widely spoken language in the world. Instead, the estimated 1.3 billion people who speak English as a first or second language might have ended up speaking another tongue entirely. Our timeline of kings and queens would look completely different too. Instead of William the Conqueror and all the famous kings and queens that came after him, including our own Queen Elizabeth II, we'd be looking at a completely different set of faces, most likely descended from a mix of Anglo-Saxon and Scandinavian monarchs. And it's not just England's kings and queens either. What do Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson have in common? Well, yes, they're all American presidents. But they're also direct descendants of William the Conqueror. The same goes for Fleetwood Mac singer Lindsay Buckingham, actress Brooke Shields, singer Justin Timberlake and Superman actor Christopher Reeve. Would all of these people have even been alive had William the Conqueror not been victorious on the 14th of October 1066? It's possible the history of the world would look completely different too. Without William the Conqueror, there'd have been no King Henry VIII. Henry VIII famously decided to split England off from Rome and form the Church of England so that he could marry Anne Boleyn. Without Henry VIII, England would have remained a Catholic country. There would have been no Church of England. Then later, there would have been no Puritans who sought to purify the Church of England of Catholic dogmas. With no Puritans, New England may well have been settled by an entirely different set of people. In fact, the US would quite possibly be a Catholic country too, and not necessarily a former English colony either. It's possible the USA may have been divided up among competing Catholic European countries. So maybe in a world without William the Conqueror, the USA might have existed as several different nations, perhaps separate Spanish, French and Anglo-Saxon English countries. It's impossible to imagine how different the world would look if the USA had never existed in its current form. Of course, all of this is wild speculation. But it's true to say that the 1066 Norman invasion has helped shape the modern world. So, let's take a look at the life of the man who, it's fair to say, had a lasting impact both on his world and ours, William of Normandy. William ruled as King of England from 1066 to 1087. He'd been born in Normandy in around 1027, which means that he ruled England for about 21 years, roughly from when he was 39 to when he was about 59 years old. Let's take a look at where he fits in our timeline of English kings and queens. Here he is, crowned king 886 years before the current Queen of England, his descendant, Queen Elizabeth II. King Canute was on the English throne when William arrived in the world. William's father, Robert, never married his mother, so he was also known as William the Bastard. At the time of his birth, his father had just become the Duke of Normandy, a powerful area of northern France. The rulers of Normandy were former Vikings, who had raided and settled on the northern coast of France in around the late 800s to the early 900s. This was around the time another group of Vikings conquered and settled a vast area of northern England and East Anglia, which they renamed Danelaw and ruled according to Danish law. Whereas the Anglo-Saxons eventually overthrew the Danes and made Danelaw part of England, in Normandy the former Vikings remained and were still there in the 1020s when William was born. William's link to the English throne was via his grandfather, the former Duke of Normandy, Richard II. His sister Emma so William's great-aunt, had married two English kings, Ethelred the Unready and King Canute. When he was about seven years old, William's father decided to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Before he left, he made the leading noblemen of Normandy swear an oath to support William as his heir, which was lucky for William, because his father died as he was making his way home. The young William was made Duke of Normandy with the support of Henry I, the King of the Franks. Given the principle that whoever controlled the young duke controlled the duchy, William spent much of his childhood being protected by a rotation of rival noblemen. 
Despite this, there was a breakdown of authority in the duchy, and three of his guardians were killed in succession. When he reached adulthood, William began to take matters into his own hands. He also consolidated his power in Normandy by taking a lead role in battles, making astute political decisions and appointing loyal men, such as his half-brother Odo, who he appointed as Archbishop. In 1049, aged around 20, he took a wife, the daughter of the Count of Flanders, Matilda, who would bear him nine children, though the records are uncertain, so possibly ten. Two of these children, William and Henry, would succeed William as kings of England. We will, of course, cover the lives of William II and Henry I in subsequent videos. In about 1051, there was a dispute between the King of England, Edward the Confessor, and Godwin, the Earl of Wessex, which resulted in Godwin going into exile. It's at this point that William possibly visited King Edward, his cousin once removed, and extracted a promise from him that William would inherit the English throne. The years 1054 to 60 were troublesome for William, thanks to the threat of internal revolt, which he eventually managed to suppress. It's around this time that he also defeated the forces of Henry of Flanders and secured his position as the most powerful ruler in northern France. In 1064, Harold Godwinson, the powerful Earl of Wessex, who William would later face on the battlefield at Hastings in 1066, was shipwrecked off the coast of France. Harold was brought to William, and incredibly both seemed to get on. The two future enemies even went off on a military campaign together in Brittany. The Normans would later claim that it was during this visit that Harold swore an oath to support William's claim as the next King of England. As a consequence, when Edward the Confessor died two years later, in January 1066, William would claim he had a promise from the dead king, made in 1051, and one from his rival Harold, made in 1064. When Harold Godwinson then had himself crowned king, William was furious and started building his invasion force. He didn't just start building an army, he also obtained endorsement for his planned invasion from the Pope, and made plans to ensure Normandy would remain secure while he was away fighting in England, ostensibly placing his wife and his eldest son Robert in charge. William's invasion force, made up of local Norman and foreign volunteers, was forced to wait several months for good weather before setting off. The bad weather was something that would ultimately work in William's favour, because it meant Harold eventually had to abandon his defensive position on the Isle of Wight and restock his provisions. Then, Harold was forced to march north to confront Harold Hadrada, who had invaded England with his army. Hadrada, the king of Norway, had invaded with the intention of declaring himself king, claiming that a treaty signed by his predecessor and a previous king of England, Arthur Canute, in the 1030s, meant that he had a right to rule England. Harold defeated Hadrada at the Battle of Stamford Bridge and then marched south to face William. At this point, the weather turned and William was able to sail his fleet to Pevensey and prepare his army. As we know, William defeated Harold, the King of England, at the Battle of Hastings on the 14th of October, 1066. When Harold died, Edgar Aethling, the great-grandson of Ethelred the Unready, was declared king by the Anglo-Saxon nobles, but it was too late. William was victorious, and Edgar didn't have the manpower to force his rule, and so he never officially became king. Instead, William was crowned at Westminster Abbey on Christmas Day 1066, and Edgar would later submit to him. Conquering the rest of England, though, was no easy task. William faced a great deal of resistance, and it would take him six years to completely secure his position, and he achieved it with a combination of violence, politics and bribery. Though those soldiers who had fought in Harold Godwinson's army at Hastings and their families lost their lands, William ensured that many prominent Anglo-Saxon earls kept their land and titles in exchange for their support. He appointed his own commanders and local rulers, who themselves suppressed revolts, and he rewarded nobles who had fought with him at Hastings with land confiscated from Anglo-Saxons. Throughout this period, William often had to take personal charge to put down rebellions and attacks. Harold Godwinson's sons raided the southwest coast in 1068, and there were pockets of resistance in other parts of England too. In 1069, Edgar Aethling teamed up with Danish forces and invaded the north. William took charge and unleashed a campaign of terror, which has become known as the Harrying of the North. The idea was to deprive the English forces of food and resources, 
but it's thought many innocent northerners were either killed or starved to death in an orgy of violence. Some historians even claim the event was a genocide, on the basis that records later showed that around three quarters of the population had either died or had been displaced. The event was even considered cruel by chroniclers from that era, who wrote that only God could forgive William. William consolidated his power by building a series of fortified castles across England, from which an army of around 5,000 knights could control local populations and suppress any uprisings. By the end of William's reign, a foreign aristocracy had effectively taken over England. About half the country's landed wealth lay in the hands of a relatively small group of William's men. Even the language changed. Instead of Anglo-Saxon English, French became the official language, and English evolved differently as a consequence. We still use many Norman words to describe things today. No one eats pig, for example. We eat pork. Nor would we dream of going into a restaurant and asking for a nice bit of cow or sheep. Instead, we request beef or mutton. Seeking to place a value on the land he'd taken over, in 1086, William ordered a survey of every single land holding in England. The Doomsday Book, produced in 1086, provides an incredible amount of detailed information about every person, piece of farming equipment and farmyard animal in the land. Around this time, William travelled to Normandy, and in the following year led a military campaign to prevent land in Normandy being taken by a rival king. William died in September 1087. He left the Duchy of Normandy to his eldest son Robert, and vowed that his son William Rufus would succeed him as King of England. We'll cover the life of William Rufus, or William II, and his 13-year reign as King of England in our next episode. Please remember to hit the subscribe button below to receive an alert when we upload our next video. You can also support us via Patreon using the link below.